I'm Jenna Burrell. I'm an associate professor here at the School of Information at UC Berkeley. And I wanted to welcome you all to our second speaker in our um, brand new speaker series, uh, which is part of the iSchool's Algorithmic Fairness and Opacity Working Group, um, which is funded by Google. And so far, we've had guests from Microsoft and Intel. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Google. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Google. Um, and also, I wanted to just say hello to the people on the live stream, because we're also live streaming this um, talk today, as we did our previous uh, speaker. Um, and the person we have speaking to us today is Don Nafis, Dr. Don Nafis, who is a, I have this, I have notes here, but I also am just going to add some things that I know about you, because I've known Don for many years. Um, she's a senior research scientist at Intel Labs. Um, she's an anthropologist by training. She has her PhD from the University of Cambridge, right? Am I right? Mm -hmm. Yes, good, okay. Um, and she has been, um, she's an ethnographer. She's been looking at the self-tracking movement, the quantified self movement. Um, and she has a great book, which I will, I will promote um, <laughs> here, called Self-Tracking, which she uh, published in 2016 and co-authored with Gina Neff. Um, with MIT Press, you should read that book, it's really good. She also has um, been the editor of a couple of edited collections, which are also excellent. Um, and she had told me that she is co-chairing the Ethnographic Praxis and in Industry Conference that for this, when is that, in 2018? Uh, 2018. 2018. In and the Hawaii. Theme will be, <laughs> yeah, the theme will be data and ethnography. Mm -hmm. um, I think that will be of great interest to many students and other people in the room here. And maybe some of the people listening in on the live stream. So we'll promote that for you as well. Um, so please welcome Dr. Don Nafis. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming out today. Um, it's, it's just really a pleasure to be here at the iSchool. Um, you guys just do some really interesting work and it's, it's just a real pleasure to, uh, to uh, speak with you all today. Um, now, uh, I'm going to begin with a small confession, which is that I did um, grow up in an anthropology department, and the worst thing about anthropology departments is that they teach people to give talks by having written talks that they read, and I've been trying for many years to pretend that I'm not doing this, but I am in fact doing this, <laughs> so <laughs> I'm sorry, um, but I, I'll, I'll try to kind of get off the text as much as possible. Um, so uh, as, as Jenna mentioned, I've been interested in self-tracking um, and, uh, and really specifically the, the quantified self community um, for a few years now, um, which as some of you probably know is a group of people who keep track of themselves in some way, right? So either um, in spreadsheets or through electronic sensing or through blood and saliva tests. Um, but the thing to know about QS is that um, it's really not anybody who's worn a Fitbit, right? Um, it's an actual community um, where people get together uh, in, per in person to discuss uh, what they decided to collect um, and what they've learned from that. Um, and so in this talk, I want to use what I've learned about those practices um, to, uh, to think through what data aggregation might mean, right? If, if we think about data aggregation um, uh, as something that happens beyond kind of large stockpiles of data that are sort of controlled by uh, some very few actors, um, right? So, so there's been lots of work um, that really talks about just how terrifying those stockpiles are. Um, and uh, you know the sort of the very real power asymmetries that they create, um, and we should in fact be terrified by a lot of what goes on. Um, but my claim here is going to be that there's uh, more than one way to do data, and that's not the only way. Um, so, so in the way I'm going to do this is I'm going to think through um, if we look closer at data aggregation not as a stockpile but as a kind of a process. Um, that sort of unfolds slowly. Um, we can think about uh, sort of maybe there are multiple kinds of politics, right? There's maybe multiple ways of knowing about the world or in fact inhabiting the world, if you want to go a bit further. Um, 
And some of those actually bear a relationship um, to uh, what I think of as ethnography. Um, so I'll point out where that is. Um, so, so what I'm, I'm working with here is this idea that the practice of self-tracking um, really calls attention to the ways that data aggregates um, that are very different from uh, the kinds of things you might see in clinical uh, medical research, right? Which really privilege a kind of a bird's eye view across a population. Uh, so, you know, for the, those of us in science and technology studies, we'd really recognize those large stockpiles as a, a form of, of God trickery, right? They, they, they make this view from everywhere and nowhere at the same time, right? So you're sort of responsible to, to absolutely nobody. Um, right, so, so here QS uh, opens, it has this ethos of participation and that ethos, I think, opens up a space for contestation about uh, who gets to, to define problems of the body and, and how you would do that. Um, now, you'll also see for some of you who are involved in the STS world um, that some of my emphasis on participation also comes from the social life of methods literature. Um, so that's work from Evelyn Rupert, uh, Norcia Mars, uh, Mike Savage, uh, mostly based in the UK. Um, and their work suggests that methods really can't be separated so easily from the social lives that they're designed to comprehend, right? Um, that, you know, they participate as well as um, uh, comprehend. And, and, you know, surveys are really a good example of this, right? Surveys were these things that, these techniques that were designed to, you know, sort of assess the world from afar, and lo and behold, um, uh, lots of us do them, right? They're not just research instruments per se, right? They participate and in fact actively reshape um, that world, right? Um, so, so one lesson I'm really taking from this literature then, if that's the case, if methods move between universities and practice and then back again, um, is that, um, Really, we can't, it's not a reasonable thing to sort of assume ahead of time that we know who has a research method and who doesn't. Um, that, you know, one person's method um, becomes another person's everyday practice and, and vice versa, right? So you see there's, you know, lots of movement um, uh, uh, around. Um, so here, you know, in a sense, data science methods are being used um, in a way that maybe data scientists themselves might not recognize and maybe clinical researchers also um, might not um, expect. Right, so uh, my title then is this notion of N of many ones. Um, and that really is something that's, that's building from uh, Dana Greenfield's work um, in, a, in a volume I edited recently on biosensing. Um, where she talks about QS as a kind of a paraclinical practice. Um, and so what she means by that is, um, she says, you know, by taking up the tools of medicine, but not necessarily its claims to expertise, um, this is medicine turned inside out, uh, where members can reformulate the epistemic cultures of medicine and care, right? Um, so you can think of this a little bit like appropriation, but um, with with some implications. Uh, so some examples of, of what this might look like is, um, you know, we see in QS in, oh, not working. I'm getting static on that one for some reason. Oh, okay. I just started, sorry. All right. Um, so some examples of what a paraclinical practice looks like is you might take blood sugar data um, and find not the presence or absence of diabetes, but the presence or absence of stress, right? Um, you might take um, steps data and find not weight management, um, but um, the onset of autoimmune diseases, right? These are real examples of stuff that people have done um, by, by taking data in a new direction. Um, and so in QS, folks sometimes talk about uh, paraclinical practice as a form of N of one research. And um, what they mean is, you know, the one is the self here, and the self is really bounding the context for what is to be known. Um, 
So, you know, we, there's, there's also a lot of literature on what is the self and self-tracking, uh, and here I'm gonna use it as a kind of uh, a, an epistemological unit, right? It's, this is the frame that situates and mobilizes knowledge. Um, so if I were to be Strathurnian about it, which is a kind of a, a thread within um, contemporary anthropology, um, I might say that self-trackers um, cut the network at the self. Um, so, you know, Strathern's idea about cutting the network um, really comes out of this problem of how you handle the infinite inter set of interdependencies that make a, a certain situation a certain way. Um, so, for example, if you think about a patented inven uh, invention, uh, there might be five people on the patent, um, there might be 10 people on the subsequent paper, and there might be 50 people involved in that reference system, and then 50 people beyond that, and so on and so forth, and then you have the invisible labor, usually done by women, to actually sustain this stuff, and then you have policy making, right? You see how this is kind of like this biblical kind of begetting <laughs> like, of, of, uh, of uh, social relationships. Um, and, and so, you know, at, at a certain point, you gotta cut the network um, and sort of frame what counts or what doesn't count. And, um, and what she's saying here in cutting the network is that um, there are really two implications of that, right? There's one implication um, that's just about how we know what we know, right? So you can think about a researcher who's trying to understand what creativity is or, or, or invention, right? They're gonna cut the network in a certain way. Um, but it also has live effects in social relations, right? Um, these are people who are making ownership claims as well, right? Um, so the argument here is that we can't be too quick to separate out those two things, that, that they're actually really tightly um, um, coupled um, and, 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 and sort of tied together. Um, now in that same volume, um, there's a piece by Judith Gregory and uh, Jeff Bowker on, um, which really argues that um, you know, there's this interesting um, emphasis on the self right now in medicine, particularly in the context of personalized medicine. Um, and they say that it's notable that that's happening at precisely the same time um, as the distinction between the self and its environment is perhaps at its least obvious. Um, so, you know, we have now more data about microbiomes, right, the bacteria in the gut. Um, we have more data about ex exposomes, right, the toxins in the environment that we live with on a day to daily basis, and of course, genome, um, all of which connect us to different, to other people, other species, um, other physical things in, in new ways, um, right? So, so really cutting the network between self and not self is actually uh, not the easiest thing to do. Um, um, be, uh, right, in fact, we see all of those things, right? Species, um, bacteria, you know, substances of various kinds actually in that self now. Um, so, so I argue that, that at least in Western contexts, and we'll talk a little bit later about other formulations of the self, um, but at least in Western contexts, right, the self, I think, actually still has utility as a give, as a, not as a given, right, not as a sort of unit that we just sort of assume away on our way to cohering a thing we call a population, um, but kind of more like a, like a heuristic, um, right, a, a heuristic that does epistemological work um, and also moral work um, in the sense that uh, it's the place from which um, Europeans and Americans are making claims and rights in data, right? We, one of the ways we think about the self is that it has a boundary at the skin, right? And, and um, data is made from bodies, right? And, and that gives us some claim on it. Um, right, so, so then returning back to this N of one thing, um, you know, Greenfield is arguing that, that N of one you know, challenges both traditional evidence-based medicine, which has a real emphasis on um, sort of large, uh, randomized, controlled tri trials. Um, but it also has another relationship with personalized medicine, right, which, which is really trying to um, customize treatments according to microbiome and genome and all the rest of it. Um, and and, it's, and it says that N of 1 is actually really different from that stuff, right? Um, that both of them, in a way, traffic in really rich aggregations about the individual, um, but precision medicine is really knows what it knows always through this generality, right? It's always making an N of a billion before it gets to a satisfying notion of what a one is. Um, 
so here's, here's one example. Um, this is a, a recent NIH project um, that uh, you know, is aiming to get biomarkers and Fitbit data, because of course Fitbit <laughs> shows up everywhere. Um, anyway, they're, they're aiming to get a bunch of data from about a million people. Um, and right, so we no longer have a sample here, right? We have, you know, the rhetoric is all of us. Um, not, n not a sample, but a whole universe. Um, and, and each person, in a way, sort of emerges af as different, right, from that kind of like mass, you have a mass commensuration before you have difference. Um, and so, you know, returning to QS, then, you know, um, uh, Greenfield says that, um, almost in passing, actually, she says that N of, N of one experiments might actually be better thought about not as N of a billion, but, um, or, or if, sorry, if we're gonna crowdsource N of one experiments now, um, that that's not N of a billion, but actually N of a billion ones, right? Where each of those ones, each of those people, um, has a coherence of a kind, but only partially related to others, right? So we're no longer assuming a, a kind of a commensuration, right, at a, at a mass scale. Um, so this was kind of a, a shorter line, and I just thought this was a super useful idea, and, and I wanted to take it further. Um, in the sense that I've been, my own work has been all about making those n of one, n of many ones, uh, sort of aggregations, right? So I don't work in billions um, because I don't know how to do that, <laughs> um, but I handle many, um, and I've been doing that um, with a technical team um, through a software project called DataSense, um, where we've been really trying to figure out kind of what kinds of aggregations. Um, either um, aggregation within one person, right, because there's still a lot of data there, um, how to do that, um, and slash across many people, right? Like, what is that relationship between the one and the many here if you're doing N of one or paraclinical research? Um, and I've also learned a little bit about the issue just by participating in um, and observing some of the discussions that have been taking place between um, the self-tracking community and, and public health research world, and there have been a sort of a series of symposia um, that kind of tried to bring those two worlds together. Um, and sort of looking at the various projects going on, uh, you know, I've kind of come to suspect that there's a logic, right, between to, about how, like, which projects kind of, what data aggregations efforts kind of really kind of, you know, make some progress, which ones stall out, um, which ones are kind of hard to do but still worthwhile to do, um, and which ones are kind of like flat out, you know, kind of a, a dead end. Um, so, so I've been doing some software development um, uh, with a team, not, not personally, um, but, you know, my method for doing the software development is not straightforward user research. Um, it's, it's really trying to situate myself in data's dimensions, right? Um, so thinking, you know, really being inside its temporalities, its, its spatialities, its chain of associations, um, and doing that, like, quite literally with the people to whom it refers. Um, so, um, you know, these, these, these pathways then, these, you know, sitting through these pathways as, you know, people themselves are kind of walking them through, um, is really what's getting my, me my sense of many here, right? So, so I kind of scope many as a, what you might get your head around ethnographically, uh, which, you know, is contested in and of itself for those of you who have participated in the anthropology debates, right? You know how hard that is. Um, but, you know, the idea here is, is kind of walking, walking through data with people as opposed to trying to build for myself a whole universe of the stuff and then sort of querying it. Um, So, you know, the phrase I, I, the term I use to talk about this is kind of lingering in data, sort of hanging out there in a way. Um, and I want to share some contrasting images for, for what that might mean. Uh, so, so the first one is the image that I want us to get away from, but it's the one that always haunts quantified self, um, which is something like this, right? Um, so you've got kind of a, a you know, white, um, rich, very thin woman um, who apparently has a heart rate of 140, and we're supposed to take that to mean that she's working really hard, right? Never mind that, you know, somebody with a heart rate of 140 sitting on a yoga mat is like not that <laughs> like, <laughs> calm or <laughs> like, 
not how it works. Um, <laughs> but it, that's, you're not supposed to think hard about this number, right? Um, uh, you, there's nothing here to kind of linger in. It's, it's sort of this like epistemological dead zone, right? Um, and so I think there's a better image, um, and I'm gonna um, pull that from a sculpture, actually, a, a data artist um, named Stephen Cartwright, uh, who carved into this uh, cube a, a topographical map, in a way. So this is a map, it's, it's sort of you know, carved into acrylic. Um, and, and so it looks like a landmass, but it doesn't correspond to a landmass. Um, the highs and lows are defined um, by how often he's, or how much he's driving. Um, so when I say linger in data, right, what I'm really asking is like, what is it like to sit at the base of that hill, just like, just after that dip, right, um, just before the rise? Um, you know, what is it like to live with the memories that sit in those places, to, to sort of borrow from Keith Basso's work? Um, how does being there connect someone like Stephen Cartwright to other bodies, to other environments, um, and, and so forth? Um, so the rest of the talk is sort of roughly like this. I'll, I'll, I'll linger in some data for a little bit, um, and then talk about those efforts at aggregating across people and kind of where that got hard and, and where we made some headway. Um, so the first kind of lingering I'm gonna do is with um, a woman named Ann Wright, um, who, uh, she's a QS member, um, she's also a former um, NASA roboticist. She actually worked on the Mars rovers, right? So there's a certain amount of privilege that does come with QS, um, even though um, the, you know, the argument here is that it, it, it also articulates a view from below in a particular way. Um, and so this is a, a, from a video um, that she did uh, with the community. Um, and, uh, and her, so she had this quite serious medical issue. Uh, she uh, found herself in, a, in the position of having a disease that you have to fight to get, which is a term I'm lifting from Joe Dumit's work, um, to, you know, to sort of, you know, there's just these classes of diseases like chronic fatigue, for example, um, where there are no clinical categories that are gonna help you. Right? Like, they just don't exist. We just don't have categories for everything in life. Um, and so she received the kind of diagnosis that, you know, the doctor said, yeah, you do have a real problem. Like, we do actually believe you, um, but we have no idea what's going on or how to solve it. And so she's like, all right, well, um, you know, so she turns to data and, um, tries all these different things, right? So, so she tries a combination of tracking what she's eating, um, what, how she's sleeping, right? A whole line of different activities, like you name it. Um, she's tried it, and, and she, what she's trying to do here is to debug the problem, um, as she puts it, right? So, so here we kind of have our first flavor of aggregation where, um, you know, it, that it turns out that like sensing and recording across multiple modalities is actually really important, right? It's not good enough to just put the Fitbit on and be done, right? And, and so that's what she's doing here. Um, and, and roughly how she works is she, she you know, chooses what data to collect, um, just makes a guess at first, and then and that, ev and that evolves um, as she develops a kind of a loose sense for what's going on, right? And so then she changes some stuff up and, and adjust the data as well as some practices to, to see what's happening, right? Um, you know, in particular to the body, you know, the body sensations that she's feeling, right? So you see the, this iteration between what data exists and, and what's going on in the body, right? Which is not that different from ethnography, actually, uh, for those of you who do it. Um, but, but she thinks about that in terms of debugging, and I, and I actually do think that that's significant um, in that, you know, she's talking about, you know, when she was working on the rovers, um, you know, there's really no instructions for how to fix a rover on Mars, right? <laughs> like, this, we don't know how to do that yet. Um, and so, you know, she says you've got to develop an instinct for, you know, how to, how to fix stuff, and that's what she's doing here, right? So, so she's interestingly not using her computer science skills, or she is in a particular way, right? What she's not doing is probability stuff, right? <laughs> or sophisticated machine learning. Um, what she's using are these, you know, techniques of, of observation that I think actually a lot of us are really capable of doing, um, but we don't think to do it because we're not thinking in terms of debugging, right? So that's where, uh, you know, again, the privilege comes in here. Um, 
so you know, one of her techniques, which I think is pretty telling of this, is that um, she actually, for the diet tracking, she took a picture of everything she ate um, instead of um, writing down all the macro and micronutrients. Um, and the reason she did that was um, because even though you know, writing all the numbers down um, leaves it available for math and you know, commensuration and all that business, um, but the pictures can actually be interpreted in more flexible ways. Um, so if you don't know what you're looking for, right, you do the coarsest possible thing first. And, um, and so that's kind of what the debugging instinct kind of gets you. Um, and she could do that because she didn't have to be commensurate with anybody else. You know, like her problem was exactly because she wasn't commensurate, right? So she has this, you know, peculiar relationship. Well, not peculiar, because actually a lot of people do end up having to do this more than you would think. Um, and, so, and so she works stuff out, right? Um, so the, the, <laughs> the punchline here is that um, it turns out that um, vegetables in the nightshade family were giving her this debilitating thing. I mean, it, it was actually, it was properly debilitating, right? Um, but the solution was like totally not medical, right? It was just don't, don't eat potatoes and um, eggplants and stuff like that. Um, so, right, so, so what she's doing here is she's collecting stuff about symptoms and, and um, uh, potential causes, and you can see sort of elements of, of, of uh, you know, what we fantasize about as the scientific method, right? Um, but a lot of the time, you know, the data isn't even that explicit, right? So in another story um, comes from somebody I met uh, through her um, named John, right? Um, where, uh, so John was having difficulty sleeping, um, and uh, so he turned to this consumer-grade sleep device. It was one of the, the super early ones um, that sort of did sleep states. Um, and. And so they, they went through this really kind of elaborate process of churning through um, uh, what that data could be telling them, right? So first, um, it was looking at the, you know, the start time of sleep, like when do you lay down in bed? Or maybe there's something to do with, with sleep duration. Um, or, um, you know, maybe there's, you know, s some other thing happening. And then finally, he comes to this point where um, they kind of literally stacked the, the night graphs on one another and found a recurrence where at precisely 3 a.m. every day, he was partially waking up, um, which is a weird thing. <laughs> and so, um, so we started thinking about, okay, well, what's in the room? Um, and it turns out, you know, machines are actually that regular even though bodies aren't. And his, um, his computer was in the room and that computer was set to back itself up at 3 a.m. And so it started worrying and, fla and flashing lights and so forth, and, and that was contributing um, pretty significantly to the sleep issue. Um, right, so for people like John, um, right, what's going on is he, he's, he's looking for clues and things that lie just beyond the data itself. Um, so not sort of, he's not believing that the, that the whole set of answers is, in, is explicit in the data, right? Um, and, and the way I'm going to think about that is, is to think with this concept of a hinge, um, which uh, can be a temporal aggregation like he's doing here, or a spatial aggregation, um, but something that sparks a memory of something, um, right? So a, a place in the data where there's a connection to the world um, from which the data came. Um, and, that, and that connection can happen in a lot of ways. You can get fancy anthropologically about, how, like, is that semiotics? Is it, you know, materiality and, and visuals and all the rest of it? I'm not making a claim about what specifically is happening here, right? But just, just marking that there's something there, and it's not in every single part of every single data set. Um, that, you're, you know, it might be the range of highs and lows. Um, it might be the, you know, location. Um, uh, or an average of this month versus that. Um, but what's happening here is, is there's something that's, that's bringing the person out of the, that sensory world of, of visualization and, and sort of, you know, number um, and into memory. Um, and, and churning through each of those, right, which is really what he's doing, is a kind of a churning, um, is really, I think, about following those hinges back. Um, into a context where, you know, that, that, that is being evoked, right, always partially. Um, and, and one way that Anne talks about this is she says, you know, what makes a good self-tracker is not actually the ability to do math, it's the ability to think at multiple timescales, right? Um, 
So I think actually temporalities are really rich with hinges, right? Um, you had, in this case, a kind of a, a, an interaction between circadian rhythms and machine rhythms, right? Um, you know, you have a, a you know, if you're, if you're looking for, you know, a pattern to do with weather, you know, you're not going to see it um, come up every Thursday, right? Because that's a human work week, right? So, but you can see social patterns and how social patterns intersect with bodily patterns if something does come up every Thursday, right? So you've got all this, like, richness here, and, and, and you've got that with, you can do the same move with space as well, right? You could do a whole kind of rhythm analysis on this stuff. Um, and, you know, anthropologically, I kind of get excited about doing it. <laughs> um, so, so that's kind of what I think a it's a little bit like to kind of be in those places, in those data sets with people. Um, and now we're going to sort of think a little bit about cross-person aggregation, right? What does that actually mean? Um, so in this, in this kind of public health uh, self-tracking intersection world, um, we have... I think right now the kind of the dominant notion is really one of data donation. Um, so right, so this is this is the idea that medical discoveries are really more likely to be made um, if somebody you know donates their data to medical research, right? So no longer tissues, but data. Um, and and so you've got this. That's also a social relationship, right? A a, a relationship between the one and the many. Um, that's really one of strangerhood. Uh, where I give you your, my data and you might make some knowledge from it and maybe or maybe not, there's some karmic returns. Um, and, uh, you, know, I, I, you know, that style of, ag of aggregation absolutely has its uses in life. Um, but strangerhood here, it, you know, it cuts the network in particular ways um, and in a way that I think necessarily erases from meaning making um, the, the, the cycles of, of computer backup that John had. Right? Um, that there's no epidemiologist in the world who's, who's going to look for them um, because that's not an epidemic. Um, but and actually, there could kind of be an epidemic here, but uh, of sort of sleep induced, you know, machine induced sleep disturbance. Um, but you're not going to see it as a series of 3 a.m. spikes. Um, what, what you really got to do is you got to know what John knows um, and, and other people like him. Right? You got you to follow the hinges with people. Um, uh, so, you know, so we've been seeing these, you know, a, a few technical infrastructures for sort of supporting a data donation model, right? And that sort of moves data around in very particular ways. Um, but we started in the lab sort of asking, okay, well, you know, what, what, what kind of a technical infrastructure actually would take that 3 a.m. backup seriously, right? What, what would that actually do? Um, and, is, you know, is there even a role for mutual learning there, right? If you've got someone like John, um, with his data alongside other people. Um, so, um, you know, roughly, you know, it, 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 to do that, and actually I, I'm looking at my slides and realizing I missed some, I apologize. <laughs> um, I missed, um, you know, this is the idea that um, finding a hinge in, this, in a spreadsheet stinks. <laughs> You're probably not going to do it. Um, but that's a kind of a, a visualization that's not John's, but kind of might as well be John's, um, where you can kind of spot a recurrence pretty easily. Um, the other thing to mention here is that I think this is like following the hinges is like the inverse of Tufty visualizations, right? Like where Tufty visualizations are really trying to like tell a story in a very carefully crafted way. Um, but if you're finding the story, that crafting isn't going to help you. It's only going to narrow what you can follow and what you can't. So there's, there's kind of this tension here about like what supports a hinge and what doesn't. Um, uh, which is all to say that, you know, we started DataSense on the grounds that we thought, okay, like, because this is where people are learning, they're wor learning in N of 1 in themselves, um, that we really need to think about um, intrapersonal aggregation first. Um, that, uh, you know, people are learning in that way, um, like Anne, right? So if you think back to what Anne has done, um, she pulled um, heterogeneous data that weren't just from apps. Um, so, you know, she's marking up things by hand, um, you know, things that actually you don't just build an API for, which is how most of the, the tech world works. Um, and there's also, of course, there's a tricky timestamp details to deal with that um, 
few people really have an appetite to deal with. Um, so we figured, okay, let's just handle a bunch of that stuff. Um, and so this is, a, I'm gonna, gonna give you a couple screenshots from DataSense now. This is our kind of our you know, file import where we do expect a certain layout and we can only do some things and not other things, but you know, it's just the idea that um, you know, we can take that stuff alongside you know, stuff that comes from more standard apps. Um, all right, so we said that, okay, like if, if exploring data is actually really about churning through the hinges, um, then um, we tried to figure out which um, intrapersonal aggregations um, self-trackers tended to use, right? Like where do you tend to find some luck and when, where do you not? Um, knowing, of course, that you're not gonna get it right for everybody, but the idea is to help that happen faster. So if it's not in our lineup, um, you can kind of go on to something else. Um, and that had, um, so there's a set of visual tools here, there's a set of kind of dra drag and drop filtering tools that I won't bore you with. Um, but the thing that I learned that was kind of surprising to me, um, or not surprising really, but um, it turns out that, that um, uh, to, if you're not a NASA roboticist, um, that, that, that churning through these hinges sometimes requires explanation, right? Um, so, you know, for example, if you're transforming data from, you know, once a minute to once a day aggregation, you know, the idea that you need an aggregation function to do that, right? And then you have to make choices about what that, is that a count, is that an average, right? So all of this sort of stuff um, is not obvious. Um, and so we, we did a, a, a series of, of um, tools to kind of just show that. Um, so here is um, the kind of the drag and drop filter area. So this is the idea, like if you wanna do some data transformations um, before you try to visualize it, um, here's where you would do it. Um, I just wanted to give you a sense for what that is. Um, uh, these explanations are, we actually went a video route, um, and I'm blatantly just showing you a video to like not talk for two seconds. Um, but here, so uh, the video I'm about to show you is um, for this tile, so you put your mood, your data in, and then you put this tile in if what you wanna do is assign um, some values for your missing data. So if you wanna create data in the places where you have holes in data, um, which again sounds obvious, but um, it turns out you gotta make choices about like, well, what sample rate do you wanna assume? And do you wanna take the average or some random number? And sometimes you do wanna take some random number because if you're trying to find you know, the, the patterns in that, you don't want it to look like the numbers that you already have. Right? Um, anyway, so here is our video. Okay, there's no, you gotta read. That's all we have to say. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, I had fun making them, which is in part why I wanted to show you. Um, right, so, so we've got these tools in place for the most part with bugs and all, and all the rest of it. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, as that part started to solidify, um, we started to ask about this question again of, of what is interpersonal aggregation? What does that do here? Um, and one of the things we had noticed in the meetings that people were going to was um, that it was actually pretty useful to have other people's data, examples of other people's data as kind of context to think with. Um, and. And, and, and um, an example of that um, comes from my own group in, in Portland, Oregon, uh, where um, we were having this discuss discussion about sleep quality sensors, um, or sleep quality scores, sorry. So there's like, you know, a bunch of apps that will give you, um, sometimes they have sensors, they usually have sensors, um, or use the phone as a sensing device, and they'll say, okay, you know, we're gonna have, we have our magical algorithm that we're not gonna tell you about, and um, we'll give you a sleep quality score. Um, 
And so some people want to know, like, what is that? <laughs> what does that mean? Um, and so somebody in that group was complaining that um, he can't, he thinks there's something wrong with the algorithm because uh, he can't possibly get below 98% sleep quality. So clearly it's the thing's broken. And um, another gentleman kind of raised his hand in that room and said, you know, I'm, I use that same exact one and I'm getting 70 all the time. So <laughs> clearly it's, you know, the algorithm is not that, not as bad as it looks. Um, and, and so it's like, okay, like that, that's interesting, right? That's, that's interesting context. Um, and so what we thought was, well, maybe it might be useful then um, to kind of, you know, try to do some of that in an online way. Um, so our, our strategy was to um, make it possible to opt in to anonymous aggregations um, for whatever data you've uploaded. Um, so the simple version, this is a, um, this isn't working anymore, by the way. Um, but the, you know, this is like the simplest possible version of this, right? So you have like a tiny little data pipeline that says take the average of everybody's steps and then spit it out. Um, and it kind of puts it on a histogram. That histogram looks weird because it's test data. Um, but the idea is you've got a histogram and then you've got, you know, wherever you are. Um, and and, and so, you know, there, we, we had, you know, a set of interesting rules around this, right? So you can't query the thing if you yourself don't have data, right? You've got to participate in order to come in. Um, and, you know, in the spirit of kind of trying to generate algorithmic transparency, because that discussion had just started to heat up, we said, okay, you know, it, it, you can get a heck of a lot fancier than that. And so the thing to do is to, um, if, you know, if somebody's querying a pool of data, um, to not only send the, um, the results back in the data, but also how you got there, um, so that other people could also build on that and tweak it and make their own kind of baby algorithms. Right? So this is not machine learning, right? <laughs> but a set of tools with, you know, that people you know, hopefully could sort of learn from each other about how to ask questions about a pool of data. Um, and of course, to do that, you need like a ton of different privacy safeguards and all the rest of it. Um, but the point is, we're trying to mimic those those triangulations, um, and that um, ended up having two problems that I think are pretty telling. Um, so first, uh, we really quickly ran into the issue of commensurability, um, which is uh, you know if you already know, like NIH already knows what data it's, it's getting, if you already are just working with Fitbit data, um, that's close enough. Um, that's almost the same thing. It turns out that there are nuances in Fitbit. That means you're not actually looking at the same thing, even if you're looking at Fitbit data. But it's the same enough where you can start to query that algorithmically. Um, if what you've got is a data pool about sleep quality, <laughs> and you've got 10 people, um, you know, measuring that along 10 different lines, if you've got a sleep quality score, and then you've got sleep duration, and you've got sleep start times, and, or qualitative, like I felt better after I, you know, I felt rested or not, right, which is meaningful signal um, too. Um, and there's one which is my favorite example. This is a real thing. Um, someone had counted the words that um, they remembered about their dreams when they woke up. <laughs> that is like a sleep quality measurement. Um, it's right, so if you're trying to fuse all that together, you're not gonna have a whole lot of luck. Um, and so we thought, you know, okay, part of that ethos of really taking the, you know, the 3 a.m. backup you know, in a way, um, part of taking that seriously is recognizing that this variety actually isn't noise. Um, that, that actually what's happening here is they're, they're emerging from very different social worlds um, that really shouldn't be imagined to be commensurate in the first place. Right? So you can imagine a clinical approach would be, oh, okay, we'll just do some transformations on it and then make an approximation and then we're all the same, right? I mean, people do this. Um, but we're trying not to do that and, and so, um, when we hit that wall, we said, okay, um, maybe it's just better to kind of pass data and visualizations along, you know, uh, individually with people you actually know, right? <laughs> um, it, you know, in the sense that, you know, Anne and John were working together, people do work together, um, right? So we, we built that mechanism. This is a, how you manage your, um, a data source, as we call it in data sense, and, and you sort of have, you know, who can use, who cannot use. Um, can you put it in aggregation or not? Um, 
Right, so, so that was kind of one solution to that. Um, the second problem was kind of more meaningful to me in the sense that, um, you know, we had this question of who in the world is actually going to query data like this? Um, we had, uh, I had this one beta tester who told me, you know, he basically said, look, I don't know who these people are and why I should care about them. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> Good point. Um, and that, again, gets back to this issue of, like, how you're cutting the network. Right, so one response, I think a, a clinical response might be, okay, like let's build in, you know, a set of demographic information and you know, location information so you could start to make these cuts by weather, like do people take a lot of steps during rainy times or whatever it is. Um, but that kind of felt to me like we're getting back to strangerhood again um, and that, that, we were tr that would be an attempt to try to make relations that didn't actually exist. Um, and, and, and so that was a little too close to data donation. Um, and so we kind of hit a little um, wall there. Um, but I wasn't fully deterred in the sense that, um, you know, we know from STS that there's no such thing as data outside social relations, right? Um, that, you know, we don't have selves that are these sealed off voids. Um, you know, we know, um, you know, for example, from Nick Merrill's work, who's in the room, that, you know, people have ideas about what sensors actually mean and, and act in response to them, right? We know, you know from the quantified self stuff that people are learning about, like, what aggregations you think to make, right, are, is entirely cultural as well. Um, so, so all of that stuff, too, was really weighing on my mind, and um, we had this major redesign kind of when we were thinking through this, um, just sort of at the front end, and, and so it was my job to do the user testing, and so you know, I said, look, you know, the thing to do here is not like just sort of straight up you know, one-on-one -on -one user testing, but actually collaborate with a group who had a reason to know about the interpersonal aggregation, right? That they know what they're looking at with that pool and have an agenda for it. Um, so that ended up becoming, in a way, its, its own user test, uh, its own research project. Um, it was called the Real-Time Health Monitoring Project, um, which is a collaboration with a group called the Fair Tech Collect Collective. Um, so that's run from an STS scholar um, named Gwen Ottinger um, at Drexel, and we had some Carnegie Mellon folks. Um, and we also had a, a, a group of environmental justice people. Um, so these are people who are, they're community members, all right, so they live locally right next to a, a very, it's in the U.S., and they live right ne next to some very serious um, uh, uh, facilities that, that emit um, very serious air toxins, right? Um, some um, carcinogens um, specifically, and it gives you asthma. And it's it's, it's um, enough to have inspired um, some uh, high-grade air quality monitoring, right? So data kind of once every five minutes for a good, you know, 10 to 20 pollutants. Um, uh, right, so, um, so we got together. And, um, you know, in the participatory, you know, design slash community-based participatory health tradition, you know, we'd sort of set a research agenda together. Um, and that was, you know, both about how, what kind of data will you collect and, um, you know, how are, how are you gonna sort of, you know, think about the results. And um, we set up a, just a really small pilot. It was nine volunteers. Um, and we kind of kitted them up with a bunch of uh, wearables, um, a bunch of apps. And the idea was to try to correlate that health stuff with um, what's going on in the air. Um, now, it very much was a pilot in the sense that, you know, you know, we know, you know, from QS, we sort of know that apps work, devices work about half the time, and then half the time after that, you get meaning. Right? <laughs> so figuring out where that, where that meaning was going to come from was really the project. Um, and, and so what we did was, um, I, which is a technique I've, I've been working with for a while, is I just, um, I just literally sat down with people and walked through data with them, both first individuals, and then we all came, came together as a group. Um, so this is a kind of a screenshot from that, so I just trained the camera on, um, on the data as we were working with it. And um, in this interview in particular, you know, so we find all this interesting stuff, like this woman, um, you know, uh, we were looking at her blood oxygen data, and you can almost tell a little bit that um, it kind of goes, it spikes up towards the end of the sensing period. And she said, oh yeah, that's because I, you know, went traveling for a week, so I left the area. 
<laughs> and it kind of shot up. And um, you know, so she had the sense that that was going on, but this kind of framed it in a, in a different way. Um, I, you know, another example from that work was, um, uh, you know, we had this, I had this discussion with another participant about heart rate and it spiking at a certain time of day. Um, and we were trying to work out, you know, is that because the pollution also does that? And, and, and factories do actually have uh, their temporal cycles. Um, or is it because of her, this, this television show that she really likes that like infuriates her? <laughs> so she's like, <laughs> you know, and, but you can have these really like critical, you know, these critical conversations about what's actually going on. Um, but the real interest here um, isn't individual data for them, right? They wanna know, right, collectively, are we, do we, are we suffering from, physically from air pollution? Um, and as you just saw, data sense is really not optimized for that. Um, and so I, I did a little hack, um, which was we have this feature um, where you can sort of throw in um, lots of, like a, a, lots of different data types, right? So, you know, that, you know, it doesn't matter what the data source is, just put it in, and we'll just sort of churn a bunch of correlations for you and put them on a grid, so it's a little bit like, um, you know, those old atlas distance maps, where you kind of go up one and then over, and then that's your correlation. Um, but we had the data exchange, so what we did was um, uh, kind of just put it all in one account, um, and then um, put everybody's in one account, and then, um, so this is just taking heart rate and correlating it with one substance, right? So we put one pollutant along the side, and then you can kind of just sort of look down the side to see, all right, are those correlations kind of matching up or not, right? So this is totally eyeballing, like real data scientists no doubt hate this, <laughs> but just kind of eyeballing it, right? Um, but what that accident did was something actually really interesting. Um, it, um, it enabled a conversation about a really complex data set um, in the room, right? So we could, because everybody was kind of spread out, um, you could start asking questions like, well, you know, that person lives closer to the factory, so do you think, is it about distance from the factory? Or somebody said, look, you know, we live in a toxic soup um, where there's lots of chemicals in the air all at once, so really maybe let's not do substance A, like one pollutant at a time, but, you know, actually try to fuse those together um, and see what you come up with that, right? It's like, okay, like we're having a, a conversation here. Um, and, I, and I think there's something important about that, right? I think there's something important to the process uh, where participants themselves are asking these questions, um, right? Av after just having seen themselves as one of those boxes, um, right? They're, they're sort of in a, in a way becoming visible as a one in the many. Um, and, and I think that was meaningful for the discussion, right? Um, there's a million different questions you could ask of this data set, um, but these were the ones that were emerging, uh, not other questions um, on this day, right, through this engagement. Um, and that conversation kind of made sense too because there was a shared purpose, um, because there's people who know each other's stories well, right? They know who's traveling, who's not, who's getting sick and who's not. Um, but also because it creates obligations, right? There was a researcher in the room, and you know, I was playing researcher here, um, and you know, I had to look them in the eye. <laughs> and there's something about looking people in the eye that really makes a difference to the kinds of research questions you ask. Um, so just to kind of really wrap things up, because I'm probably running a little late now, um, this is, you know, it's just a pilot. Um, but I think it's a pilot that speaks to this broader argument that I've been making uh, about there being more than one way to do data, um, right? And, and some of those ways uh, do, in fact, make room for situated knowledge making. Um, but making room for that also means making the data flow a little bit differently, um, both at a technical level, but also at a social level. Um, uh, and, and part of that also means that the social life of one's methods have to be acknowledged, right? We, I'm not pretending <laughs> to not be in the room or not care about what these guys find, right? Um, all right, so, so there's, you know, coming back, coming back to Marilyn Strathern's work then, um, right, she, oh, do I have to stop now? <laughs> um, right.
right? Marilyn says that, that social relations are not simply the things that we, people have, they're the things that people think with. Um, they're the vehicle through which we're, we make new knowledge. And, and I think that's what we were doing in the room that day. Um, the, the, the volunteers, me, the devices, the accidental design, right? We're all participants in this knowledge making, um, not so much as a research sampling, um, but really kind of an unfolding. Um, where the knowledge and the questions sort of unfolded through these relations, right? So the relations were a research vehicle, in effect. Um, and we also did cut the network, right? We didn't chase any and all potential connection. Um, uh, you know, only some mattered to us. Um, but that, that cutting was really made possible by a shared set of assumptions about what a self is. Um, of what a community is, right? And, and, and the assumptions here at work in the room were selves that had interiorities, right? They watched some TV shows that other people didn't watch, and they went traveling and all the rest of it. Um, but they, they also had obligations to one another, um, and, and that was important there. Um, and, and those were a set of beliefs that I think existed alongside also notions of population, right? They're kind of like coeval together. Um, and notions of strangerhoods and, and extractive economies of, of data donation. Um, now, we could even speculate just a little bit more radically, right? We could say that, you know, maybe, like it'd be interesting to think about what a data science would look like that assume wildly different notions of personhood and environment, right? Such as those that you find in the Melanesian literature, which is where Strathern's work comes from. Um, right, these are places where knowledge is never about something kind of in the ether abstractly, um, but actually where knowledge is really embedded in physical objects which people own, right? So you can think about those dots then as something you own, um, but also because you own it, um, you take a very deep responsibility for its consequences, right? For the, the sort of the set of relationships that follow from moving it over to another person. Um, but we're not dealing with Melanesians, right? We're dealing with Americans. And, and I'm making that, that pretty radical comparison um, to remind us that, that notions of populations, notions of samplings in expert-driven knowledge making, right, those aren't just epistemologies, those are actually existing social relationships. Um, that, that the NIH's notions of data of all of us really does have a particular time and place to it, right? Um, uh, at, that to donate at scale right, relies on notions of alienability um, that, you know, we can speculate more pointedly about where those come from. Um, but I think what this, this, this little foray into environmental health actually shows that N of a billion um, doesn't just cut the network in a way that returns, you know, things to its donors in a kind of a vague way, um, that it actually works works through a set of relations that place real limitations on what can and can't be known, right? That, that N of a billion is, is big and it's useful, but it actually doesn't have the capacity to learn the things that we learned in that room that day. That's it. if instead of sort of starting with problems and therefore looking to see how this N of 1 works, mm -hmm. is if we can sort of flip that and start to think about some problems where N of 1 may work better or worse, mm. and how to think about sort of when we can aggregate, how much we should aggregate, sort of where in the spectrum between N of a billion and N of 1 we should be for a given issue or problem. Yep. I mean, okay. the other way to think about it would be to rephrase the question of 
the first person NASA engineer wasn't actually in an N of one situation. It was just that she didn't know that she was in the community of mm -hmm. nightshade yep. problem people. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. And so yeah. I'm thinking of sort of more of clustering. Like how do yeah. you use your personal data to find the communities in which you fit in so that you can borrow from yep. relevant experiences yeah. instead of irrelevant. Yeah, I, you know, I think my talk in many ways was the elaborate version of what I learned the hard way, which is you got to find that through the social relationships that, um, you know, no amount of, you know, like, let's, let's try to be smart about that. And, you know, um, you know, and certainly, you know, where my mind goes are the, you know, the rare disease communities and, you know, the, the f folks who have found their people. Um, you know, but in, it, it's like this interesting problem of you, if you don't know where yet, then where do you go to learn to know how to go where? Um, and I'm not sure, and I actually don't think data sense solves that. I think it, it, it helps, but I think the thing we found is that you can't, you can't just do that in software. Like, you've got to have people in some room, and maybe that's not environmental health, it's something else. Um, but I just, I think that's really, I mean, that's just the thing I've just been struggling with, is how do you get from that I'm an outlier to, oh, here. You know, and that, that's, you know, I think QS stays in outlierhood, right? Because everybody's so fragmented, everybody's doing their own thing. Um, so what's, you know, what's the delta between that and, you know, the disease communities and, you know, the environmental health folks who have a very clear understanding of what that is. And I wish I knew. Oh, come on. <laughs> So uh, maybe I'll ask both questions. Okay. Um, I'm really interested in this data sense tool, this thing you're creating with a team of software engineers, and what what's the story of that tool? Where is it? You know, where is it? Where is it going? Ah, <laughs> oh God. <laughs> what's, what's <it> <laughs> um, and then I also thought, um, I you know I spent some time myself trying to think about where as a small end person, mm -hmm. as an ethnographer, where I fit in this data science, emerging data science world. Um, and I think in kind of early, my early thinking about this, I thought, well, we're all kind of interested in kind of the lived reality, right? Like a lot of data scientists kind of tracked in the moment. Mm -hmm. And ethnographers like to observe people doing things when they do them, not just having them self-report, right? right? Yeah. Um, but you brought up this issue of commensurability, which I thought, oh, that, that is another really interesting hook. Mm. Um, and you know, as an ethnographer, we don't have to burden ourselves with commensurability of our data. We have like 30 people that we talked to and lived with and understood very well, and we write a very long ethnographic monograph, mm -hmm. um, narrative in a narrative format, mm -hmm. and we have that kind of luxury to sort of unpack the very diverse, divergent stories that people tell us. Mm -hmm. I have no idea how that all of us project could possibly work. If you have a, like a million N of ones, right. is this, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about your book where you talk about people collecting data without any idea what they're gonna do with it. Yeah. There's not really a plan, it's just we can collect it and we yeah. can stockpile it and there's value and the market, you know, reflects that there's value in all this data we're stockpiling, but right. we have no idea what to do with it or what we can get from it. Right, right, Do you yeah. think this NIH project is maybe an example of that? Because um, <laughs> I think what you're telling <laughs> yeah. is yes. a story of kind of emergent communities yeah. finding their own way to kind of gain meaning and find patterns in data through yeah. a lot of labor-intensive but yeah. personally motivated efforts and building connections. Uh, how does yeah. that, uh, how is an N of one right. times a million Figure. of valuable proposition. Right, exactly. Well, I mean, I think the thing about the NIH project is it's actually, it's not N of a billion ones, it's N of a billion, just straight up. <laughs> um, and it followed my mind so much, I remembered it as a million. Yeah, yeah. no, it is a million, no, it is a million, <laughs> yeah, no, sorry, it's, yeah. It, it kind of doesn't, I mean, but then with this data set size is, is off of a million people, it's like, okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't think they're thinking these terms. I suspect not. I mean, they might be, which would be great. Um, if I were running that project, the thing I would do was I would send like 10, 20 teams out to do this stuff first about the data sets they're like thinking about, and then maybe kind of have a way of, of thinking about how you can get those questions 
right? I mean, I actually, I do, you know, and, and the, the live discussion in the environmental health world is, you know, that's not bad. Like, you know, we want, you know, like large scale sensing systems to catch the stuff that's, I mean, that's a huge area of undone science. It's just woefully inadequate, right? So there's a role for super, like large scale stuff there. But I would, if I were running it, I would start with those smaller, um, seemingly smaller things to get better at figuring out what the good questions are. Um, and I wouldn't assume that um, clinical research had all the answers to that, although they have, certainly have some good ones. Um, you know, I think the commensurability thing is, you know, the thing I almost like about data is it makes your incommensurabilities really explicit really soon. Um, in ways that you have to think harder about when you're thinking ethnographically, but I think we do actually work on commensurability. I mean, that's, that's our whole thing in a way, right? That, that the whole process of writing is, to, is thinking through what is or isn't commensurate. And a lot of the anthropology right now is trying to make a much, much more radical claims about, um, you know, they're, they're asking questions about the impossibility of translating between social worlds. I mean, they're kind of, running towards very radical incommensurability. Okay, well, it's a big debate. I, I won't register an opinion about it. <laughs> um, it's tough, it's, and they, they have some really valid points in there. So therefore, you, you know where I sit. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I think that intersection between the social commensurability and the numerical commensurability or not is this really interesting site that um, is worth attending to ethnographically. Um, and since you asked about data sense, um, we are, um, we're winding down active sort of new feature development right now. Um, and we, there's a live discussion about, it's not a commercial product because it's just, it's, it's not that way. Um, and so we're asking questions about, well, should we be hosting it? Should we be, you know, inviting other partners? You know, should there be a role for open source? Like, how does that all work? So um, for those of you who are interested in the software side, um, if that's of interest to you, please, please do. Thank you, Don, for actually um, bring out the new ones that, that between one and a million, there are these interesting, you know, manys that, mm -hmm. that I have not thought of uh, mm -hmm. before. But it's fascinating to me that you've chosen, you know, in, in this pilot, in a sense, it's a, it's a group of volunteers, mm -hmm. um, bottom-up, grassroots, you know, sort of sharing a common question. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm wondering, I suspect that there would be other types of social relationships where maybe it's more top down. I'm thinking, mm -hmm. for instance, in, in the workplace where the manager says, all right, everyone in the work group, let's start collecting some data and we're going to analyze the data because of some corporate question we want to answer right, right. or some other context. So, mm -hmm. so do you think that um, there may be different parameters that may make these uh, end of many mm -hmm. uh, work better or not work at all. Yeah. Um, in yeah. addition to maybe the social dynamics, power dynamics, yeah. know, what might be other parameters? Yeah, exactly. Necessary? Yeah, I mean, there could be, there are so many, you know, flavors of what many, many could be. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, and because, you know, because they are real social relationships as well as a sampling, yeah. um, you know, there's always that, um, like where does power sit? Um, how does that all work? Um, you know, in, a, in an odd way, I can imagine if what you're doing is workplace sensing, um, you know, you can imagine workplaces where the hierarchies are so strong, they don't bother, like they just do it. And so <laughs> your commensurability thing isn't a problem anymore. You can imagine a more progressive work workplace where that, um, uh, where commensurability does come to a, an issue, it does, does come to a head, and you can also imagine one that was actually employee-driven, right? That was all about um, where is, you know, what's happening at the work site <laughs> that's making our jobs harder, right? So then the sensing is of us, but the focus is on the physical infrastructure or whatever else it is. Um, so it's, a, it's an interest playing with what the social relationships are then gets get you into like different research questions. But yeah, I think there's a million of them and they're, and they're worth exploring. We, we, we in our research group, we had uh, the PhD students decide that we're all going to put on uh, biosensors on ourselves and watch an episode of Black Mirror. 
<laughs> together. Some of you remember this. And that, now I'm thinking through, um, well, first of all, I'm glad I wasn't the one who, who mandated that. But on the other hand, you know, what type of social dynamics, peer pressure, that yes. we when, when we all decided to opt in into the exercise. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you. Sure. But I want to maybe pick up on this thread a little bit on um, commensurability and kind of maybe centralization or power in these mm -hmm. sort of relations mm -hmm. and sort of how sort of what, what you've seen um, sort of relates to like who, who is in charge of deciding what is and is not commensurable. Because yeah. I think I'm familiar with like the debates you were just referring to around like anthropologists debating like to what extent, you know, radical uh, commensurability or incensurability. Colonial empires didn't care. They did it anyway. Right, in terms right. of like generating a whole bunch yeah, of yeah, we're so gonna like, get we, it whether we like it, you like it or not. <laughs> and so I'm wondering like like how you sort of see those tensions at play in terms mm -hmm. of like who gets to decide like what is a good like commensurating with care versus you know something that's more yeah. uh, top down or sort of uh, has concerning power issues that we should yeah. be thinking about. Yeah, the um, you know I, I mean I see it in two places you know in the. Um, the, the series of symposia that um, QS Labs put on between public health researchers and people in the self-tracking community, um, that was really at stake, and, and people were very much, you know, I mean, there was this great quote that I was trying to weasel in but couldn't about APIs as, you know, the data you get through APIs is an opinion about the data worth having. <laughs> um, and, you know, there, I. I think there were tensions in the room about, um, you know, there were the, you know, let's let's scale up and donate, folks, and then there were the let's let's hold on here, and um, I think they got to a place where there were there where there was even a discussion, right? So the first set of meetings, it's like it was kind of like, but by the end, you know, there were clinicians talking about doing their um, you know doing their own self tracking to come to understand what it is they put patients through. <laughs> you know, so <laughs> something happened. Um, yeah, I mean, the other thing I found through the pilot was, um, you know, the, the QS folks are like, they can get pipey about these things because they kind of know how to do it. Like, they, you know, they know, they know it's a choice. Um, and the thing I really struggled with in the environmental health pilot was that these were people who do, they really understand it or quality data and how you would create aggregations and good aggregation method and bad aggregation methods and sensor quality. I mean, they're really into the technical details on that. Um, but for the stuff I was doing, that was new. And so um, having a top down in the sense that somebody was a little bit more directed about what is this? Well, how about this direction? How about that direction? Like you need that kind of someone to provide that little, that push. Um, but then, I mean, I had to draw on all of the anthropological instincts about how you deal with, you know, the little bit of power you have <laughs> to do that in a reasonable way. And, you know, so, but sometimes a little bit of top down is the enabling thing because you're putting something, you're making something available that wasn't available before, right? Another question, so okay. I will take the opportunity. <laughs> um, where does, I mean, does data mining figure into this world at all? You know, the idea that, okay, all these people are kind of collecting data about themselves. We can dump it into some sort of, um, you know, pattern learning algorithm, a machine mm. learning algorithm, mm -hmm. and discover something. Mm -hmm. Are people talking about that at right. least, or is it just, yeah. I, and I'm asking that because this is the algorithmic fairness and opacity sure. working group, <laughs> and we've sort of been talking a lot about data, and we really haven't talked explicitly about algorithms that might be yep. um, run on that data. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, there's there's two things to say. One is that um, a lot of the um, the technical um, community in Silicon Valley ends up ends up engaging with QS on the idea that that might be going on. And there are some people who just do that. Like, and I, I think there's more than going on than, 
you know, some people collect data for themselves to create the stockpile, and then they don't touch it with a barge bowl. That, that happens. Um, and so a lot, of, a, a lot of the way I talk about QS is deliberately, and I, and I think there's, you know, there's a large threat of the community is very deliberately like, that's a bad idea. <laughs> and in part because you're, it's you yourself who has, you know, collecting can be no joke, right? It's not just put on the Fitbit, right? It's, it's taking a picture of everything you eat. Like there's only so much you can do. So you can't create a stockpile that much if you're really doing it in a fine-grained purpose, purposeful way, like you just, you're gonna end out a run out of labor, <laughs> um, but you know it's funny. We um, we did try to um, in data sense we um, we put you know uh, uh, one of a, a very a very good machine learning person um, in the equation and said, look, you know, let's let's see what we can find, you know, and then you know maybe make a new feature where, you know, for the stuff that you can't do with a Pearson correlation, let's see if you can find, you know, compound and you know complex. Is it you know, maybe it's not the caffeine and the sleep, but it's the caffeine and this that combines to relate to the sleep or whatever it is. And it didn't work. <laughs> it just was not happening. And even, I mean, and even at the design level, it wasn't happening, right? So there was the, are you getting anything meaningful out of that? And you know, this, it wasn't bad machine learning. I mean, it's all some very good people. Um, but, you know, the, the data was, you know, you don't understand the domain necessarily. We had heterogeneous uploads, so you're not, you don't know what problem they're asking about. You don't know, um, so it would do two things. It would find the spectacularly obvious, like, did you know that sleep or steps is related to elevation? Like, yeah, I mean, we got that, <laughs> you know. Or it would just be like w this list. So we expect, okay, maybe it'll get a list of 10. Right, or we'll do, we'll cut it so that you'll have a, you know, the most, the things we're most confident, like we'll take the 10 things that we're most, 10 relations that we're most confident in and then cut it off, right? And the list is so big, you just can't do that. Like it just, it would just produce, you know, and we thought, okay, that'd be a reasonable thing to do for like hypothesis generation. And it just, it just was not workable. And then at an interface level, like how do you design that? And we tried, we really did, but it just, so yeah, no, it's not, not working.